And welcome to the first in a series of videos of the group reading of Ern Heidegger's Being in Time. I'm joined today once again by Daniel. Daniel, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I wanted to apologize to you and to the audience for the uh, technical difficulties which um, got in the way of um, the start of this series. It was supposed to be Sunday, actually, and I, I didn't have internet for um, a couple days. The I had a power outage in this house, and then the line that supplies internet to this neighborhood in India um, is damaged, so there were a few obstacles to getting this started. So, um, so sorry to you and the audience, but I'm just so delighted that we're finally able to start this. Yeah, I'm excited to get going. Yeah, and I just, uh, yeah, and I just wanted to uh, mention that um, Daniel today, I will and let you maybe lead the discussion, and you chose to have us read chapter three, which deals with uh, the worldliness of the world. And I guess my first question to you is: any particular reason why this chapter is the place that you wanted to start this group reading? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think this chapter. Uh, gives a lot of concrete examples of exactly what Heidegger's saying, um, whereas chapters one and two are a little more abstract. Um, so I think we can even go back to those chapters in light of what we learned in this chapter through examples, through more concrete way of looking at what Heidegger's saying, um, and then kind of go from there. So that's why I thought chapter three, and I think chapter three is just uh, super interesting, and there's a lot here. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, I totally agree with that. And I remember the first time I read Being in Time back in like 2010, the beginning was at that time to me completely incomprehensible. Um, all the talk about ontological and ontic just made no sense. But this was where it really started to click for me back in 2010, because here you have like the famous example of the hammer. I mean, that's sort of the biggest um, sort of uh, iconic um, thing in Being in Time for a lot of people, whether they agree with the book or not, they'll remember that story stuff about the hammer maybe being too heavy or you're being absorbed in using it. I think this is really where a lot of people, it starts to make a lot more sense. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Maybe before we get to examples like the hammer, we'll just back up a little bit to sort of introduce ourselves into the chapter and what he's doing as an overview and then get into more specifics. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll try to kick some things off. So yeah, so we had, as you talked about in your previous video on the introduction to being in time, Heider's posing the question of the meaning of being. Um, he talked about why we need to reawaken the question. It's a question that's been forgotten. It needs to be reworked, rethink, rethought. Um, and so for Heidegger, uh, the sort of story of how we get into more abstract concepts like worldliness is that we can only pose the question of being through the being who asked the question or the person who lives with an understanding of an implicit sense of what the question is and even an answer to that question. So just to jump things off, what he talks about is Dasein is not, it's not the human in some sort of naturalistic sense. Uh, it's not a bipedal animal. It's not a rational animal. What it is is this new conception of what he calls Dasein or being in the world. So chapter three is sort of the beginning of unpacking what that term means, being in the world. So being in the world is gonna have a, generally speaking, a three-part structure. It's gonna have being in, then it's gonna have the who of Dasein, and then the world. So chapter three focuses on the world, or what he calls the worldhood of the world. And so chapter three is unpacking what this means. Okay, so first to investigate what the world is, Heidegger wants to, examine those, what he calls entities that are in the world. Um, so entity is just Heidegger's term for, for thing, it, or it's just in the, in the broadest sense, um, it's anything. So what is the world and what are those entities in the world? So for Heidegger, the world is the meaning context wherein Dasein lives or dwells. Uh, and tell me if you're fault, if tell me if I'm missing something. Um, and so rather than sort of mere things that exist in the world, like he's not denying the existence of regular things. So like pencils or uh, tables or people or trees or whatever. He's not saying those don't exist or anything, but it's a reworking of what it means for those things to be. 
So he calls things in the world what they proximate, proximately and for the most part are, are equipment or ready to hand entities. So rather than things just being what he calls present to hand entities, uh, just individuated substance things with properties that exist out there regardless if I'm around or not, which is what most of the tradition takes things to be. Hydra's not denying that, but more what he says is things have meaning within a lived context. And so things are tools or um, they have some function within practical life. And sort of this is the most fundamental and uh, base way in which things are, quote, dealt with or encountered uh, within the world of Dasein's life as Dasein, the human, lives it. Um, so maybe I'll stop there and see if you have anything to add to that as a starting point. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much for that. That was really great way of explaining it. I think you're doing a great job, um, not only for me, but also for the audience, for making um, some of the stuff which might be a little difficult to unpack if you're just reading the words on the page, especially your first time, you're really making it a, a lot more accessible, putting into this sort of, um, you know, everyday sort of uh, way that we would be able to understand it. So I think you're doing great. If you want to just maybe continue with that explanation, um, sure. you could just go ahead and do that. Okay, awesome. All right. So as we said, the things, they're not even things, because things is sort of a misnomer for how it's, it's a, if we lay, if we think of things as things as just, self-contained individual substances. So, you know, we say the table is what it is when I'm not around sort of thing. And we think of it in this way, we're missing or covering up what Heider calls the world put of the world, which is that within which things for the most part are for us within our encounters with them. And what things are in our encounters with them for the most part are what he calls equipment or ready to hand entities. Okay, so ready to hand entities are tools or something with a meaning or a function or an importance or whatever, some sort of sense, or you have a grasp or sense of a thing, not as, for the most part, not as an individuated thing with its own properties, such as uh, thickness, height, color, texture, whatever, but more so it has a function within a context. So, all right, we can give many examples. Higher gives plenty, many, many examples. Um, his parad paradigmatic uh, example is the hammer. So what is a hammer for most people, right? Uh, a hammer is fundamentally, as we engage with it, not just this sort of small or medium sized object with a certain sharpness and color and whatever, rather it's a tool to use in the context of hammering or building something or using it in some way. Um, and so we encounter the hammer through our absorbed um, through our absorbed grasp of the thing in our use of it. So this is sort of Heidegger's point of departure for examining what he calls being in the world. And we, for Heidegger, uh, you know, there's many, we can think of many ex other examples. We use pens in this way. Um, even natural things, even like trees, if you use a tree for shade, car has a certain meaning or function within your life as you use it. Um, books, the same thing even words we'll, we'll talk about later in being in time. So things for the most part have a sense or tool, a tool meaning it's for something. It's used in order to do something. It has a meaning. Uh, and there's many different types of meaning that we can talk about. So, so that's sort of the first part. And then we can go deeper. We can say, okay, what are the conditions that make possible that thing as a tool? or have a kind of meaning. So Heider is gonna say something like, tools or things, equipment, as we approximately encounter them, not just use them, but grasp or make sense of them, is that these things aren't just, we, we, when, when we talk about using a hammer, for example, it's not just that we hammer and that's the end of it. The hammer is always already, this is Heidegger's term for, uh, we'll, we'll talk about what this means. The, the, the hammer is already within a context in which a hammer even is or makes sense. So there's a tacit reference in using the hammer to other things within the context with which hammering is possible. So it's going to be, so you're going to have nails, you're going to have wooden boards, you're going to have your hand for using it. Um, you might also have 
I don't know if you work at Home Depot, you're doing things there, then Home Depot is present in your hammering as well. It's not just that you're in the building that is ho called Home Depot, it's that the Home Depot has a certain meaning as you're hammering. Uh, and we can talk more about this. And then this will also be connected to projects you have. So if you're building a wagon or something, I don't know, the wagon is has a meaning in the hammering as well. And it's also gonna feed into why you would even be hammering as well. So from we first had ha we first had the hammer as a sort of tool but now to make to really understand what the tool what the hammer as a tool is we have to make we have to understand the tool within a context of other things that relate to hammering and that hammering relates to as well and so this is the beginning of what Heider's going to call the world and so the world is that meaningful context or situation within which you as docsign operate or dwell in um and we can think of many more examples like driving. Driving, the, the, you know, the wheel to drive isn't a wheel really. It, it doesn't, you don't grasp it as a wheel unless you're already in the context of driving or going to work or, um, you know, have for, for, for whatever you have to do or whatever makes sense for you that, and it's, it's also gonna relate to, you know, the, the, the tires are working. You're gonna have this sort of expanded network of meaningful things. They're all connected and reference one another that constitute the world. And so that's sort of, that, that's how we get farther uh, into this chapter. Um, any Anything, uh, yeah, if you wanna jump in or uh, I can keep going if you want. Yeah, no, that, was, uh, that was an awesome way of unpacking what is a pretty difficult book, you know? It was, it's been called one of the most difficult philosophical texts um, ever written. I definitely think that that's not far from the truth. And um, I think bringing it back to things that make sense to anyone who's ever worked with tools, like the fact that when you have a hammer, um, you don't really understand um, what it is by sitting there and staring at it, in a certain sense, the understanding is actually, I would also add, more on the outside than on the inside. One of the big things that Heidegger mentions in, you know, these opening chapters is the fallacy of thinking that um, understanding in, in this sense of, like, equipment takes place within this type of interiority of the mind, whereas really there is this type of outsideness which I think goes along with the concept of Dasein being in the world is this fact that you don't have to like leave your mind to get out into the world. I mean, you're already there. It's only by this type of obfuscation that you might be misled into thinking that you're not already out there in the midst, caught up in involvement, things like that. So Heidegger is really all about bringing us back where we've already always already been, which is on the outside. And mm -hmm. by being on the outside, the correlate to that revelation is that you don't even really have to stop and interiorize what the hammer is in terms of taking stock of its color, et cetera. Um, you know, when I was a, a woodworker, um, although not a very good one, um, if you were to even ask me questions about the color of some of my equipment, I might not be able to tell you right away. So I used a, an ax, uh, or excuse me, I used a, a saw. Um, all the time in my wood shop, um, and I certainly knew it by by the touch in my hand of what it felt like and and the motion and how I was supposed to hold it. But if you were to ask me today about the color of it, I wouldn't really know. Um, I have a, a vague sense that it might be some shade of brown, but taking catalog of what color it was along with how long it was, all of that was not the primary way of understanding in the very broad use of that term, that tool. It was really more a matter of being out on the outside where it could do its job. And it was in doing its job and being caught up in it that it was functioning precisely the best when you didn't have to stop and look at it. And I think that that's maybe the, the first thing that I would take from rereading Being in Time after having a couple of years of experience of, you know, dinking around with woodworking and blacksmithing tools and things like that. Sure. Yeah. So, okay. No, you unpacked a lot there, which is a good, let's try to see if we can pin it down. Exactly. So Heidegger, yes. Some of the things you're talking about is tools, like for example, a hammer or a steering wheel or a pen. These are things we would normally take as in a sense, yes, it's a tool. And Heidegger is talking about tools 
And when we use things, as you talked about, as you gave an example of your uh, past experience as a blacksmith, et cetera, we don't quite notice the sort of properties or qualities of these things when we would kind of just step back and examine it in a pure looking sense. So I have a book, it's red and white and black. That my grasp of the book in this way is gonna be different when I actually read the book and I'm engaged in it. So Heidegger is yes saying this, but I think this is a this is a narrow way of understanding what Heidegger is saying. So you have people like Dreyfus, who's one of the pioneers in bring Heidegger to America, has a very pragmatic reading of Heidegger, um, of what he called of what the of the tool analysis we've been talking about, the ready hander equipment. So he's going to say something very similar to what we're saying. Um, our fundamental engagement with things is one of use, in which we are skillfully absorbed in our encounters with things. So it's not the case that I just see things, I encounter them, I use them skillfully. So you can think sports, you know, when you're in a soccer game, you skillfully manipulate and grasp your situation as you go about playing. If you weren't, if you couldn't do this, then you wouldn't really be in the game of soccer. You would just be walking around aimlessly. Um, same with hammer. And if you didn't know how to use a hammer, you couldn't grasp the hammer as a hammer. You wouldn't, you wouldn't view it as that. You wouldn't, engage with it in that way you need the skill to view it as a hammer for hammering so this is sort of dreyfus's take from it i think this is limited why because it's more than skill so a lot of the examples we've been giving is like of tools but tool when higher talks of tools or zug or equipment or ready to hand he means it in a broader sense so for example the the clothes that you wear are equipment not in the sense of to do something, it has a broader sense. It's not like I'm skillfully using something. It's more like the your clothes have a significance or meaning within the context as you live. For, so for example, if you, if you wear something to express yourself and then you go about in the world um, wearing those clothes, you're almost giving off a meaning for others, a signal in some way, whatever it is, whatever you know, you're know you wearing clothes for, you don't, you don't really have to be aware of it, but th this is a meaning or significance or tool sense that your clothes have, um, you know, think, think of what you wear, what kind of shoes or whatever you wear. Um, it could be anything from, uh, you know, we, we, we can think of many more examples. A computer is only what it is within a certain context of using a computer, but not, not even just skillfully manipulating it as a tool, but, um, also just like the things on the keyboard, like they have a sense. So even words and numbers, they're not just tools, they have a meaning or sense. So anyway, we can we can keep going with that, but I think maybe um, we should keep going. So some more examples of what Hyder is saying, um, quote, or before we quote, so things we encounter in our concernful dealings, the things we come across for quote, writing, suing, working, transportation, measurement. These are all sort of ways in which, these are all types of, tools or wor working isn't a tool, suing isn't a tool, but the, we have a sense or grasp of things in the context of writing, in the context of suing or working. Um, example, uh, more, more examples. If I'm a teacher, it's not just that I skillfully know how to use the things a teacher knows how to use. It's more so like the meaning of things arise within the context of me being a teacher. So papers are gonna have a certain meaning. Um, for me, you know, I have to get this done. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I care about my students, so I have to do X, Y, or Z. It, I, I, I can't give you a psychological analysis of each sort of way of life for different people. You know, encountering different meaningful things, but you get the, the big picture. Hopefully, um, he gives more examples. Even nature, even nature doesn't escape this equipment tality or. Um, uh, meaningful grasp. So he's going to say, quote, the wood is a forest of timber, the mountain, a quarry of rock, the river is water power, the wind is wind, quote, in the sails. Um, as, as the environment is discovered, the nature thus discovered is encountered too. So even nature doesn't escape the sort of worldliness um, of our being. Uh, yeah, I've said a lot. <laughs> um, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and 
I mean, yeah, it's absolutely right that um, the American University Appropriation of Heidegger, which we mentioned in our last live stream, um, which someone like Zizek will critique, Zizek will um, call it the American like appropriation of Heidegger to try to turn it into this anthropological analysis of how humans use tools, things like that. That's a part of it. That's obviously not all of it. And I think that where that um, leads you, if you go beyond this sort of safe appropriation of Heidegger that they'll you know, present in, a, in the kind of rationalist environment of uh, the, the modern American university and instead expand it beyond just using tools to kind of making it the, the character of stuff within a world for the lack of a better way of putting it. Obviously, we're not just talking about it being stuff, but um, if we talk about having the world, then on the basis of um, being in a world, you have to talk about the stuff in the world with this type of terminology rather than the ways that we're used to talking about it. Um, and I think that where that leads you is surprisingly enough, uh, kind of in a similar path back to Aristotle. And Heidegger, before he was famous for like being in time, before he was famous for Dasein, he was really famous locally for doing these amazing Aristotle lectures. And if you ever read the Heidegger lectures on Aristotle, they're really something unique because he was freeing us from a couple thousand years of dogmatic Aristotelianism uh, by changing the way that we think about long taken for granted terminology, even like substance. Usia in Greek does not really mean the kind of substance that he critiques Descartes for espousing in this chapter, chapter three, um, and yet it's also not meaningless. It, it really meant more like the literal concept of an estate or a piece of land rather than this sort of artificial term substance which became dogmatized later um, in like the Middle Ages. So he's in a certain sense taking this back to Aristotle and yet he's taking this in a direction very different from Aristotelianism. And I think that um, things like the referentiality that you mentioned here or the idea of you know, um, understanding the tool, not just being a matter of like skillfully using it, like being a master of using it, but also um, uh, being attuned to its role for lack of a better word within this whole referential totality of involvements. Um, it's something which to me almost sounds like going back to Aristotle because it's almost as though we're going back to the old Aristotelian notion that if you really want to understand what something is, you have to understand what it's for. That's become one of the most sort of politically incorrect and unpopular um, things to talk about these days is the sort of teleology, which in like Frankfurt School of Critical Theory for like Adorno and Horkheimer, teleology becomes synonymous with exploitation. For Adorno and Horkheimer, teleology becomes synonymous with manipulating stuff to force it to do what you want. And there's this whole sort of legacy carried over into Habermas too about teleological action being that which is abused by propagandists, et cetera, to, to manipulate people to doing what they want. And yet, I don't think there's anything really sinister necessarily about talking about teleology. Um, I think it's going a little too far to say that Eris, I mean, Heidegger is, is literally making in this into a talk about final causes. And yet, I think he's sort of salvaging this old Aristotelian insight that if you really want to understand what something is, you have to understand what it's for. I mean, does that sound like maybe taking it a bit too far in your opinion? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a good line of thought. I think for Heidegger, there's a few things. One is that things can have a meaning for us or th things have a meaning for us um, and they can have a, they, they, they can have a functionality or a use, that sort of thing. That I, one, I think that, that's partially overcome by thinking of tool or meaning or sense in the broadest sense. It doesn't just mean like I use tools for hammering and then everything is for something in, in this sort of sort of um, way in which we can just manipulate or, you know, everything's just for our own use. And we, you know, we dominate over things. Heidegger throughout his career, you know, continually says things like, you know, man does not dominate over things. Rather, it's it's in a sense the other way around. Um, but so, yeah, so when, so things, it's not like we can just, one, it's not that we can just like choose 
what we want things to be. Like I can't choose the book to just be whatever tool I want it to be. As, as we're going to learn later, I think in the book, a lot of the meaning that a thing has, has already been given to us. It's not, it's, we, we, we've already been socially, culturally initiated in particular ways in which things presence or have meaning for us. Um, so while, you know, we could use a book as a weapon to hit someone, for the most part, that's not going to happen because we aren't living in context in which that is a thing or that even makes sense to do, or we don't find ourselves in meaningful situations wherein a book manifests as something that, like, I don't know, in, 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 in ways other than it normally does, I suppose. And we, we, we're not masters over things in a sense. We can't just, we can't just manipulate everything however we want it. So I think this, this understanding of the teleology of, as you talked about, you know, Heidegger's equipment or ready to hand, I think is unfair to Heidegger. Um, if that makes sense. Uh, what, what, what do you think? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, it is, it's going a little too far to strictly call it teleology. And yet at the same time, there's something a little bit like the old Aristotelian ideas popping up in Heidegger, I think in unexpected places. Um, certainly it's not a matter of taking this sort of centralized position with regard to everything else in the world and just making it conform to whatever project you, you wanted to, to do for you. I mean, that is definitely kind of the adorno Horkheimer, um uh, thing that they're critiquing. I'm not saying that's what Heidegger is interested in, but I think that for him, um, having an understanding of the sort of referential totality of involvements in which he keeps talking about, you know, the sort of a what for and so forth, however it's translated in, um, you know, the different translations of this book, I think is kind of maybe um, taking us back to something which, in a lot of being in time, is not even Heidegger coming up with stuff that nobody's thought of. It's rather maybe stripping away some of the stuff that has gotten the way over time of us understanding what a long time ago was was still um, a way of, of thinking about this stuff. A lot of this is really just going back to insights, which for the ancient Greeks, I think, um, a lot of the stuff was actually um, kind of like what they were thinking about. And I think that, um, the notion of something having a meaning in terms of its involvement with the referential totality of involvements rather than just being, um, you know, encountered as a uh, present at hand and objective, I, I don't think that necessarily puts it into a state of passivity with regard to you. I don't think that that is just an expression of you making stuff do what you want it to. There is a type of thrownness with regard yes. to um, what those involvements are. It's not just that you're like internally devising what they should be and then projecting it out there. It's rather that you yourself kind of have almost a state of passivity with regard to encountering those involvements as sort of being out there on the, on the outside already. Right. Yeah. No, I, it, you're correct. It's not that Heidegger thinks the human can just construct, you know, uh, meanings or sense for, or, you know, a, a function for things. No, there's a sense in which Dasein has already grown up in normalized, culturally, socially situated ways of using things. It's not like I don't have this power to sort of just um, construct ways in which things are used. No, uh, we grow up in worlds that are normative and have certain ways, embedded ways of uh, operating and things that have meaning that we learn and take up uh, to which we get initiated in over time. Though Heidegger doesn't talk about this sort of growing up process much at all in being in time, because it seems that he starts from the sort of, so to speak, grown up person. Um, I, Heidegger is not saying that we just construct the world. Ra but this is, this is an important question for Heidegger studies is, is Dasein a sort of passive receiver of meaning in some sense? Or, or is it in the more Husserlian sense where I construct meaning as if my mind has this sort of uh, meaning making power, right? So this is sort of a huge debate in higher studies. I think, you know, I don't quite know, it's a huge topic, that there's, there's either a combination of the two or that the dichotomy is a false one. There's some other category 
it's not we 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 don't we don't construct things, but we don't we're not passive. It's more it's a kind of co-receptivity uh, or a correlation. So there's something about us and things that sort of are mutually dependent on one another. I don't I don't I don't know how to categorize it or really talk about it. Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, but yeah, it's definitely not that we just construct meanings from some inner meaning making mindful power. And I don't think it's just that we passively receive it from the outside. Uh, there's sort of some either in between or some other category of talking about it. Um, that might be beyond the scope of this, uh, this chapter, uh, in my knowledge, but, uh, yeah, maybe just keep going through the chapter. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. Um, I think one quote that I underlined today as I was rereading this, which might be kind of related to this is, you know, I, um, focused on this section where, um, he talks about, um, Dasein as understanding and interpreting sort of discloses significations which found the possibility of words and language, which means that disclosed significance precedes the totality of, of relevance is kind of the way that's worded here, which means that um, it's not so much that the, the referential totality of involvements is either something that you're um, constructing interiorly and then projecting, nor is it something which is simply encountered as being objective in the sense that there's no role of hermeneutics involved. This is kind of the way that um, biology, for example, adopts this sort of pseudo Aristotelian terminology of saying that, you know, um, the, the natural world is um, something for which the, uh, the purpose is kind of objectively given in all cases. Um, whereas for this, it's more like you only get to have that referential totality of involvements of that tell you what something is sort of for within this, um, this context, if you have hermeneutics as the foundation. And I was just wondering what you think about that relation between hermeneutics and referential totality. Sure. So I think that's a great point to go from here. Okay. So yeah. So in the introduction, as I you talked about in the last video, we've talked about in the previous videos the what Heidegger calls the hermeneutical circle. So he thinks that the hermeneutical circle is not a problem. It's rather the way into phenomenology itself, into understanding being as such. So the hermeneutical circle is the problem of how can we interpret anything if we don't already know something. But it seems that to know something, we have to first interpret it, right? So we have this sort of circle of how do we know something without knowing anything, but don't, but to know something, don't we have to come to know it? So you have this sort of circle. So Heidegger is going to say, this is overcome because we already operate with a grasp for understanding that leads the way into a, into another kind of interpretation. So for example, this, the, the hermeneutics, the hermeneutics, the study of interpretation, it gets played out in the beginning in, in chapter three here. How? Well, as we sort of, in, as we already touched upon, when we talk about a meaningful thing or tool or equipment or ready to hand or even present hand um, being the case or uh, being encountered as we meaningfully engage in the world, that, that, that thing as a tool or whatever only has its meaning or is what it is in light of a context wherein it comes about, right? So you have, you already have this interplay of whole and part you have that, which is, the sort of tenet of hermeneutics, you have the the thing arises in the context which you're already embedded in, but the thing also contributes to the overall context. Um, and so this is sort of, I think, one of the hermeneutic, one of, one of the places where hermeneutics becomes explicit in being in time is where you have this sort of context, part of context interplay that's always already in play in your life as you go about it. And so the interpretive process of not so much meaning making, but the co-receptivity of things in person that brings about a context in which things arise as useful to which then those things as useful contribute to the context. So I think this is a move, a hermeneutical move in Heidegger, I think. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think that hermeneutics is also a useful way for talking about this concept that we've been you know, grappling with for this whole discussion, which is the difference between 
merely constructing an idea in your head and then projecting it out there, um, which is the, the, the kind of teleology which, um, you know, Adorno and Horkheimer oppose, um, but also the difference between merely encountering something which is just objective. That's something also like a huge role in Heidegger in that the idea of brute matter, which simply is objectively that rather, um, rather than um, having a type of meaningfulness within this type of um, hermeneutics of, of, of what it is. Um, I think uh, this gives you resources for going beyond that because the thing about interpretation is, in a certain sense, it is your own. And yet it's not completely your own because um, interpretation is always, in a certain sense, constricted by what it's interpreting. So to give you an example, if you're interpreting a book like um, War and Peace was the example I gave last time. A really long book is a good example of you know something that definitely will involve um, going through the hermeneutic circle. It's not that you're just able to have your own interpretation. There is a type of constraint, I think, which is introduced by the fact that you're interpreting something which does type of meaning already um, that you have to be accountable to. Um, I think that that's why this is a more useful way of talking about the sort of halfway or I would say neither position uh, between the subjective projection and the objective um, sort of solidification of meaning is already being there. Right, yeah. So for Heidegger, what he calls the subject-object um, dualism or subject-object dichotomy, the distinction between uh, uh, a, sub, a subjective experience on the one hand, coming to know by way of some mental activity, things on the outside. Um, this dichotomy, this, this, this um, schema, Heidegger thinks, is mistaken. Not only, be, why? Because with this schema, you miss sort of what we've been talking about. You miss sort of the all, always already engaged context with the world. Because if we start from an inner consciousness or subjective experience to which then has to reach out of itself into the world to come to know of things, either objectively or subjectively, you're, you're missing the sort of primary or primordial relation of human with things and with other people. Um, yeah, so you, you miss hermeneutics altogether. Uh, because you have to ask, how do I come to know something? But but you already you already know, but no has to be crossed out because it's not no in the sense of like, I'm able to recall certain facts, such as if I'm studying for a test or something. It's more like I have a, an implicit grasp of things as I go about living. And this is one to which we've already been embedded in and initiated in. Um, and we just unreflectively, without even thinking about it for the most part, though we can't think, we just, we just use things or engage with things and with other people. And uh, yeah, so the subject object dichotomy, as you talked about, misses this boat completely because it sets us up for questions that won't bring us to this sort of more primarily, primary, primary relation with the world. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I think that that's why Descartes is the person he chooses in this chapter to be, as he calls, the extreme counterexample. I think Descartes was also kind of like a founder of, um, you know, as Foucault calls, founder of discursivity, and that a lot of other, so like after Freud, there was a lot of other psychoanalytic thinkers. After Marx, there was a lot of other Marxist thinkers. After Descartes, there was a line of other Cartesian thinkers. Um, there were guys like John Locke or like David Hume or like um, even Leibniz who were still conceptual, conceptualizing the problems of philosophy now with this sort of Cartesian way of going about the problem, which um, Heidegger is formulating his thesis in opposition to that whole mentality of um, considering the mind engaged with ideas is kind of the trend in modern philosophy. Um, if you're reading whether the empiricists or the rationalists, the debate is not whether the mind is engaged with ideas. The debate for rationalists and empiricists is which, which of the ideas are the clear and distinct ones. So Descartes has that famous um, quote about the clear and distinct ideas. It's ambiguous which ones they are. Are they the rational ideas, in which case 
truths like two plus two equals four, that's the, the clear and distinct idea. And then you get, <clears throat> excuse me, rationalism, even going as far as Leibniz saying that on the um, basis of reason alone, you can not only understand everything you need to know about a triangle, you can understand everything you need to know about anything that has been created by God on rational grounds alone. And then on the other hand, you get the empiricists saying that the clear and distinct idea, it's not the rational, <coughs> excuse me, idea, it's the, um, it's the empiricist ideas. So you basically start with nothing and you sort of, by the ability you have um, to this empirical openness to, to get data from the outside, you slowly sort of build up this repertoire of knowledge about the world by taking in the ideas because the clear and distinct idea is the empirical idea. And Heidegger's going to dispense with that entirely because for him, it's not that there's a mind that's concerned with ideas or it's employed with um, being busy with ideas. It's rather that the very terminology of the Cartesian legacy is simply inapplicable to what Heidegger does. I want to ask you what your thought about the sort of first um, subsection that engages with Descartes specifically. What was your reaction to the kind of charges he raised against Descartes? Do you think that they're fair after, you know, um, you know, maybe looking at Descartes on his, on his own terms? Do you think that Heidegger's critique of, of, of Descartes is fair? Because some people don't, like Zizek, wrote a whole book, The Ticklish Subject, um, which, you know, I, you watched uh, my, my take on that. Really, it's a book, it's a defense of Descartes. Um, the, he deals with Heidegger at the beginning because that was the greatest refutation of Cartesianism, but the book is actually a defense of Descartes. So what was, what was your reaction to his critique of Descartes? Do you think it's fair? Sure, yeah. So uh, this, the subsection you're referring to is the fourth subsection of chapter three in Being in Time. Uh, so it comes after what we've hitherto talked about, about uh, the relation between uh, equipment and context. And then in the, the section after that, he's going to talk about broken down equipment, which we should get to. And then after that, he's going to talk about signs, which I think is a fascinating topic. And then he's going to get to his sort of critique of Descartes or Cartesianism as you, uh, as we have begun to uh, explore. Yeah. So a lot of, so yeah, I think uh, when I first read this in school at college, um, I was like blown away. I think it's super fascinating. Do I think it's, you know, spot on. I don't know. Um, but I think the ideas are fascinating because with Descartes, it seems for Heidegger, so for Heidegger, Descartes sets up ontology as a sort of uh, dualistic framework of mental substance, res cogitans, and uh, extended body or thing, uh, res extensa. And so one main question, once you set this dualistic framework up is how do the two interact, right? And so it seems like there's a there's an impenetrable wall, impenetrable wall between the two because it seems like we can't we can't find some sort of causal uh, mechanism that allows their relation. Like, wh what is the relation between the two? Because it seems like on the Descartes, on the Cartesian understanding, you know, we are self-contained inner minds that come to know and interact with things in the world, and it's obvious for Descartes because uh, you know we can uh, we can use things and. Uh, come to know things. So there is a relation, but how does that relation work? So for Heidegger, once we've already set up this dualistic framework, we've already missed so much. We, we, we've restricted ourselves in our philosophical analysis and we've missed the, pri as I've already talked about, we missed the primary ways in which we're involved in the world and what it is to be a human being in the sense of Dasein. We're not going to get to any of that. Why? Because our conceptual framework has already missed it completely. So for Heidegger, we have to break out of this. We have to break this down. And part of this then becomes a linguistic issue because we can only talk, we can only, we can only come to understand these terms by talking about them or conceptualizing them. So our conceptual and linguistic tools that we've been using within this framework of dualism for Heidegger, we have to overcome it. We need new tools. We need new language. That's why he comes up with all these new neologisms, these strange ways of speaking these different terms and vocabulary. Um, so it's, Heidegger struggling to break out of this um, subjective objective dilemma in his eyes. So how do we do it? We have to break away from substantial thinking. So for Descartes, the red cocketon res extensa, the mind and thing, extended thing, these are like their 
two own individuated separate substances close to the Aristotelian, Aristotelian sense of the word. Um, but substances for Heidegger, substances with accidental or necessary properties. So for example, um, you know, we can ask what's a cat? Well, there's some inner substance that is a cat and then that cat can have different uh, accidental properties. So maybe the fur or um, the fact that it meows or uh, has toenails or whatever, a tail, those, might be accidental features of the sort of substantial core of what a cat is or whatever. So for Descartes, what a cat is would be some version of uh, mind plus body. And then there'd be, you'd have necessary and sufficient properties that constitute the cat. And so for Heidegger, we're, we're, we're missing the worldliness. We're, we're not getting to it because we're, yeah, we're, we're still in the substance dualism. He's, he's trying to break away from substance dualism uh, to get to our, our ex as he calls existence our essence which is our existence which is our um at least initially on the surface level it's our it's our uh meaningfully absorbed engagements with things not to be reducible i think to skilled coping but a more uh broad sense of meaning and it, 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 it gets deeper as we unfold throughout being in time so yeah i think the break from substance dualism is fascinating uh and allows one to have new conceptual and linguistic tools to think and talk and to get at and to see what Heidegger's saying, I guess. That was a long tangent. What do you think? Um, yeah, I, maybe even before we get to the critique, we, 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 should, we should get to the, the, the two chapters proceed, the subsections preceding the critique, even though the critique of Descartes is essential. And I don't think you can understand Heidegger without it, at least in being in time. Uh, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know. What's good? You you want to, uh, yeah, that sounds good. What did you want to um, maybe start with with the reading chapters that come uh, before the Cartesian critique? Sure. So yeah, we've definitely talked. We've definitely hit on the critique a lot. I think. I think there is more detail to it that we can go into. Um, but just to get there, so let's recap what we've said so far today. So first, we've said that what we primarily encounter is not substantial things with properties. He's not denying their existence, but what he's saying is we, for the most part, we primarily don't encounter those things. We encounter tools or meaningful, I don't wanna say objects because that term is already biased with substantial thinking. Uh, it's, it's more like things have a meaning within the context of our lived life, right? And so you have this sort of interplay of context and and uh, meaningful thing, either either tool or zug or thing as use, um, and so that's where we start. We have a thing within a context, a meaningful context or situation to which we are in, and we're going to talk about this in later on that comes in the following chapter. Okay, so so we can definitely we definitely engage with meaningful things, but then Heidegger can, is going to say there are times when things can take on a meaning that sort of breaks down. So. For example, uh, when something goes, quote, missing or something's obtrusive or it's it's in some sense strange or um, something's in the way of of how we normally engage in the world, then we, this is he's going to call this unreadiness to hand or a broken down piece of equipment. So his paradigmic example parad uh, is, again, the hammer. The hammer fails to do its normal socially culturally embedded task that is hammering nails or whatever, if it's dull or it's just broken, we're gonna view, we come to see the hammer, not as in the way we did when we, you know, normally went about hammering it in an everyday way, but more so we view it as broken. We view it as uh, no longer performing its function. We, per, we view it as um, malfunctioned or maybe, you know, for some reason we can't do our hammering job. Uh, maybe we're distracted or, at something obtrudes our normal everyday just hammering and so something i don't know so, 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 something goes wrong in our work in our working uh on the on our on our project that involves hammering we're we're missing a piece of wood that we need and so that missing piece of hammer gets grasped is becomes grasped as missing within the context of our making a desk or a, a desk or a house or something uh so the meaning as missing 
or as in the way or as broken only appears within the context of that thing missing in our projects of lived everyday life in the in a, or in that situation right and so when this happens Heidegger is going to say that the thing then can come to be revealed or, or we can then encounter it as sort of a substantial thing with properties so when the hammer breaks we can view it as sort of just an extended an extended thing or uh you know whatever w w in, in some other way so maybe we need a we need a new hammer head we need a new ha head on the hammer so we need a we, we you know we, we need to know the size and the measurements of a new hammer head to put on our hammer and so then the property those those properties the size and shape of a hammer then become relevant for us and a, a appear in our meaningful context um and so then there's sort of th that's why for Heidegger, the present hand is derivative because the present hand only arises within a context that sort of breaks or something's missing, that sort of thing. Um, so this is this is the beginning of the broken, the, the 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 broken tool, and the hammer is his main example here. Um, but you know, he gives uh, you know other examples. Uh, let me look real quick. Um, yeah, so yeah, if something needs repair, if something's unusable, if something fails to do its what it's supposed to do, it needs to get fixed, or something's in the way of our being able to use something, then things appear in that light. Now, why talk about the broken hammer? There's there's sort of bigger purpose for Heidegger. It's sort of, and this is where more of the hermeneutics come in. So Heidegger is going to say something like, the broken tool sort of reveals the whole referential contexture of the world wherein Dasein dwells or is. So, um, you know, if I'm driving and my tire breaks, Heidegger is going to say something like, we come to be more, I don't know if it's like we become, I was actually going to ask you this. I don't know if it's that we become more like explicitly aware of the world to which we're in, or there's some other sense. And he's going to say that the world quote lights up. So, when something breaks. And so it's sort of the whole referential totality that we're embedded in at the moment. So it's going to be, you know, whatever purposes we're using uh, things for, why they matter to us, why we're concerned with things, what place or function things have within the context, that sort of all gets lit up in a sense when things break. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll stop there and let you chime in. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So um, I don't know though that I'm quite grasping what the question was. You said that you were asking about things lighting up when something breaks down. Could you maybe elaborate a bit more on the question? Sure. Yeah, that was ambiguous. So okay. So by light up, I mean like the world, the referential totality of the world comes into view in some sense. Now there's a sense in which we're already engaged in things, and we already have a tacit grasp of those references which constitute meaningful things in our world. So we should actually talk about reference because we haven't really talked about what reference or referential structure is. I know I'm talking so fast, so interrupt if I'm, I'm going somewhere that is confusing. So we talked about how a thing has its meaning only within a context to which you are embedded in and to which that thing makes sense within a certain context, right? So the context is constituted by what Heidegger calls like referential relations. So things are gonna things are gonna reference each other. So the hammer is gonna reference nails. We use a hammer to hammer in nails. The nails are gonna reference, you know, our need to want to build a house. That's all that's also gonna reference other things in the house that are involved in our building the house. It's gonna involve our plans for building it. It's gonna it's also gonna um, you know floorboards and walls and that's also going to tap that's also going to reference like you know our need to protect ourselves from you know the weather or the elements or something um and it's also going to reference other people within the context of building our house so other uh people that are working on our house building our house people we're consulting with to build our house it's also going to reference our reasons or projects or building the house in the first place we want a house or um we want to build a family, we want somewhere to live. We want to live in this location rather than that location. So this reference, referen referential totality the constitutes the world. And it's sort of 
ex- it, it's not just constitutive of one thing in the world. One thing has its place in reference to the other things in the situation. Um, okay, so then the broken tool, the broken tool is when something is when like there's that those referential relations, something sort of happens. It's 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 more like there's something there, there there's a reference there's a reference or things take on a meaning within that referential totality in such a way that like something's missing or something's in the way as we talked about something's obscure the the normal ways in which we were normally embedded in the world sort of break down in those ways so that's one so the broken tool is sort of a breakdown in the referential structure it's not that the referential structure goes away it's just that things arise in terms of they're missing or they're obscure, but that's only possible within the context itself. Okay, but what's the method? Then the question becomes for me: What's the methodological function of fundamental ontology of Heidegger's whole project that the broken equipment is for? So I think it's because, like for example, why mention the broken tool at all? The main reason is because for Heidegger. It, it lights up the world, which is to say it brings the world into focus in some sense. It like, it's like when, when the hammer breaks, you now become like aware of that situation to which you were already, you always already were in, but you didn't notice because like, you, just because you're in a situation doesn't mean, you know, you're able to name every reference relation. Like, you know, like if, if you're a perfect Heideggerian or something like that, no, you have a, you have a non-thematic um, tacit grasp of it that makes possible your experience in the situation you're in, but it, that doesn't mean that you, you come to know it in any explicit sense or anything. And I think for Heidegger, the broken tool is sort of a way in which we can come to have a, maybe a more explicit grasp of the world. I'm not quite sure if it means like, if a tool breaks, then we come to understand that world or those referential relations to which we're embedded in more explicitly or it means something else. So if that makes sense, what I've been saying. Uh, so I guess my question would be, what's the, what's the, why, why, why would Heidegger even talk about the broken hammer or the broken tool? I don't know if you'd be able to shine some light on that. Yeah. I mean, speaking of shining a light on something, you know, the idea of um, at the very beginning, talking about the etymological link between phenomenology and um, coming into light, since the word phos that he mentions in Greek in the first um, you know, part of the introduction as being the real sort of etymological basis of this concept of phenomenology, which most people don't know, um, like it plays into his uh, concept of truth, I think, in that for him, um, the negative connotation of um, aletheia in ancient Greek is difficult to capture either in the German word Wahrheit or in the English word truth in that for us, those are merely positive linguistic formulations that um, don't allow us the same access to the ancient Greek concept of something being unconcealed, something being not concealed, which means that it's um, been allowed to be brought into the light um, in a way that you're appreciating um, in the sort of negative sense, which we miss, which is the word truth. And I think that although it's maybe not explicitly linked, this um, concept of, you know, the, the referential totality lighting up when something goes wrong, as you put it, and this more general concept of light having something to do with truth, um, I still think that that's a connection which you can make. And I was just wondering if you think that there's a connection between truth in the sort of ancient Greek sense of unconcealedness or aletheia and um, the type of lighting up that you just mentioned. Sure. Um, yeah, so he, um, let me think. I, I, I think by, I think there's a few different senses of the word lighting up. Yeah, so in one sense, we're talking about like aletheia, which means unconcealment which Heidegger is going to say something like, yeah, lighting up or letting be um, different sense, different ways of talking about the same phenomenon, which is what Heidegger is going to call truth. Um, I guess, yeah, so I guess what I meant by, I, I think there's a different, yeah, so lit up, I think, means something like, 
or to light up means something like um, to come into to come within the horizon of docile situatedness. I think that's what it's ultimately going to be or something. So like, for example, as we've been talking about the hammer or whatever, the hammer is going to be lit up or be discovered only within the lit up context to which docile is embedded in. And so this, yeah, I guess, and I know, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I know Aletheia is sort of Heidegger's, it, it's the formal indication for Heidegger's talk of just truth as such. But I don't, I don't know if, I don't know how it would apply here. I guess by light up, I didn't quite mean in the sense of Aletheia. I, I meant it more in terms of, I, I, I don't know what Heidegger means by here. I don't know what he means by the broken tool lights up the world. I, I don't. I don't know if it just means that we, because the world's already lit up, we already have a non-thematic grasp of the world as we go about it. Right? I'm in a world right now that involves computers and me talking to you and uh, pens as I'm writing notes. All these things they all they all have a relevance or context or place within the world as I engage with it. So the world's already lit up, but the the broken hammer lights up something new or different that wasn't lit up before. And I don't know quite what it lights up. I, I, I think it's a it lights up the world as such, but I don't quite know what that means because the world's already lit up. So it has to light it up in a different way or does it mean I explicitly come to know of the world so I understand the referential relations that I was taking for granted and not quite uh, explicitly getting it before. So I don't, I don't know what, I, I'm, I guess my question is just what does Heidegger mean by like, what does the broken tool do? I, I, I get it that it means that things are revealed or understood or grasped as broken or missing or in the way. And in that, the present at handness of the thing can reveal itself. Um, you know, the hammer breaks and I have to understand in terms of measurements of size and shape and color and quality for whatever purposes it matters in my context. So it's, it's, it's a different kind of intelligibility than just, you know, using the hammer. Uh, I, 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 I grasp the hammer as broken and needs fixing. So I have to understand in terms of, okay, how, what's the price that I have to buy it at, you know, different, different substantial properties, at least for Heidegger that I have to understand the hammer through to get through whatever context I'm getting through. But I think there's something more, there, there's some other methodological function of even talking about the broken, the, the breakdown at all for Heidegger. And I don't know what that quite means. For example, he's going to say, I'm trying to find the quote, he's going to say something like, uh, the, the 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 broken piece of equipment is going to disclose the world in some sense in some new sense but i don't i don't i don't know what that means i guess does that make sense um yeah i guess the only thing that, i guess the only thing that comes to my mind right off the bat is um one of the critiques that zizek makes of heidegger and other people who appropriate this sort of phenomenological concept of the world. So life world is also a big thing for Husserl, and that's picked up by Habermas as the sort of um, context for doing communicative you know, um, processes for Habermas is you can't just do communication in a vacuum. You're held accountable to life world, which is intersubjective, right? This is Habermas's big thing is you're only communicating rationally if you're held accountable to this publicly shared accessible world that we're all sort of part of. Um, and if you're misleading people about that, then you're breaking the rules of communication. And Zizek's really not a fan of the broader phenomenological concept of life world because Zizek is not so much interested in the smooth functioning of the sort of organic um, whole of the life world, which we're all just sort of um, primarily unproblematically caught up in. Zizek is not really interested in the sort of unproblematic absorption and this involvement with life world, which only occasionally breaks down and that's okay. merely secondary. Zizek is much more interested in the way that as somebody who adopts the sort of idiosyncratic version of Cartesianism, you're not organically integrated with life world, you really are out of joint with it constitutively. And for him, that's the, the main reason why Descartes is interesting, because Descartes does acknowledge that you're not just unproblematically one with the body. There is this type of subjectivity 
which is out of joint with the body and with life world as whole. And I think that that sort of resistance that Zizek has to life world as this too unproblematic absorption and inclusion in this organic whole um, misses the point or maybe runs the risk of downplaying the extent to which for someone like Heidegger, there is a type of um, importance to the, um, the, uh, the, the, the moments of breakdown, which you lose if you simply talk about it as the sort of unproblematic inclusion which you might be tempted to do. Um, I think that if anything, it's a type of challenge to the ease with which some people talk about life world in, in, those sort of, in that sort of way. Whereas for Heidegger, I think there really is something important in that type of breakdown. Um, like I think maybe his sort of inheritance of Kierkegaard's notion that if you do just sort of get absorbed in the idle chatter of the crowd, as, as, high, as Kierkegaard puts it, then really, although it might seem like you're just sort of unproblematically absorbed in your surroundings, you really are missing out on the sort of deeper existentialist call to have to make a leap of faith to go beyond that. And I think that like sort of a breakdown of, of involvements, this sort of um, break with um, the sort of smooth functioning of life world is something which I think has this type of productive potential, at least for Kierkegaard, for making that leap of faith, which otherwise you'll, it, it will never have to be problematized and you'll never have to make that decision. I don't know if that maybe um, is, is uh, too great a leap to, to make to bring Kierkegaard in, or, um, or, or not, but uh, that's the main thing that comes to my mind. Sure, yeah, I, I don't know too much about Kierkegaard, I'll admit. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I would say that when it comes to life world, you know, Husserl coined the term, I, I think, and then Heidegger, it, it's, it's tacit and pervasive in being in time, even though I don't think Heidegger employs the term. So I think, yeah, but I think, again, I think, we should avoid the more Dreyfus interpretation of just like the smooth, non-problematic, absorbed coping and things. And then when things break, it, 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 like, like it again, I, yeah, I, I don't, so let's back up a little. For Dreyfus, Dasein is like a skilled coper. So he's like, or, I don't want to say he, cause it's he or she or whatever. So yeah, Dasein is skillfully absorbed in the world on problematically. And then there are these moments of breakdown as we've been, trying to talk about as if there's like a disruption of the life world. I, I don't, I, I don't think that dichotomy between broken and smooth coping is a good one. So I side with you and I guess Zizek there. I think, I think life world is broader than that. I think uh, one's immersion in world. It's not, it's not just like I'm a smooth coper and everything's fine. And I do things on thematically without questioning it. No, it's more like, I, I, I think that dichotomy is, is a is a mistaken one. I think it's more just like whether or not thing there, there's no smooth coping person. It's not that we can't be a smooth coping. It's it's that things are just meaningful whether or not things are broken or not. Um, so I guess things things have their place in a context um, and that we are constitutive of and that we are all constitutive of. I guess I I I don't know I, I don't I don't know if we have the resources to quite talk about it at this point in our reading of it. I wonder if we have to go more. Uh, but I don't know. I, that's a good question. I don't know if I have a good answer for it. Uh, yeah, maybe we should just move on. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Um, I think that uh, you know it's one of those things which you know maybe is more related to the later sections of the book the stuff that i was bringing up with kierkegaard maybe is more related to later sections of the book yeah, i think that you know this connection might, might still be made but um yeah if you want to just move on to the next thing that interests you that'd be great sure okay okay great okay so so we we, we talked about sort of uh equipment hopefully we did a decent job there a little bit about what higher calls a broken tool or or uh unreadiness to hand so maybe the next section, signs. Signs is is quite obscure a chapter, I think. Uh, it's a difficult one, or we'll call it subsection. It's a difficult one, but I think I think there's I think there's some good stuff there. Maybe we can move on to the next one. Seventeen subsection seventeen reference and signs. 
Um, I was trying to read some secondary stuff on this as well. Uh, I can actually send you the art one article I was reading if you want. So, okay, so what is a sign then? Heidegger talks about this um, other kind of thing called a sign. So for Heidegger, a sign is something ready to hand. It's an, it's an, it's an item of equipment. So it belongs to a world. It belongs to a referential totality. It has its place within a world. Uh, and it's not just a substance with properties. Uh, rather, it has a meaning or a sense or it either as a tool or whatever. It does something within the context to which you're immersed, right? So it, it's an equipment. And then it's a particular kind of equipment, and there's something special about it. So the question is, what kind of equipment is it, and what's special about it? Okay. So um, as he says, like all equipment, a sign is the, the, the being of a sign is reference or assignment, right? So signs reference other things, but it's a special kind. So he gives examples of what we normally call signs. And he's not denying that these signs are signs. He's just giving everyday examples, I guess, in an intuitive way. So he's going to, so he's going to say signs are equipment that have the specific character of showing or indicating. So he gives examples, we find, quote, we find such signs and signposts, boundary stones, the ball for the mariner's storm watching, signals, banners, signs of mourning, and the like. So he's talking about what we normally call signs, different kinds of signs. So I guess signs, what he says is they indicate. So the, I think the most famous example of a sign he gives is like the, um, D directional signal on a car. So either go right or left when you're at a stop, uh, uh, you know, you're going to take a right, you're going to put on your blinker to take a right, whatever. So, so he's talking about this. And so this is a sign. So a sign has a meaning within the world of driving, basically. Um, it signals to others and to yourself of like something that the car is going to do. Right. And so it indicates, or I, I think the surface level mistaken view is something that like the sign indicates like an intention so you so we, we we might think of like uh a car directional signal as like it it it, it it indicates or refers to my intention to turn right or something right and so that's what a sign is okay now this is it's not wrong it's just incomplete so this so the sign so so the sign uh so the directional signal on a car is what it is indicates only again only within the context of driving to which then that makes sense so for um so who, who what what is that sign indication who is that sign indication for so it's going to be people on the sidewalk walking down the street right they see a turn signal or other drivers but only within those contexts of someone concerned with things such that a sign is useful or makes sense so I'm trying to think of examples of a signal where it wouldn't really be a signal. So if I was like, I don't know if, if, uh, I, I don't know. I, I can't think of example. I can't think of many examples. Uh, I don't know. Think of like you go to a car show or something and all the cars are just parked and no one's in the car and the turning signal goes on. You, it's going to be a confusing thing. You might think that there's just something wrong with the car. It's not necessarily that, you know, you expect the car to turn left and it might be a danger. So you got to stay out of the way and you got to move appropriately. It's it, the, 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 the blinking light takes on a kind of different meaning in that context. So it's only within the context of sort of driving as we all sort of grasp it. And so the sign's going to have a different meaning for different people. So it's going to be, it's going to be a communicative sign. So I, I think I'm just dwelling on this example, maybe too much. So yeah, the people walking down the street, it's going to be a signal to them in the context that they're walking to some place to avoid danger. Um, and you know, everyone already assumes that everyone has a grasp of what it is and what it does and why you would use it and when you would use it. Um, and so it's also going to refer to other things within the context of driving. So it's going to refer to traffic lights, to stop signs, to lines on the street, to why people would even want to be driving. So this whole context is already in place for the sign to be. And so the sign sort of, it indicates to others sort of what to do. But again, we have to be careful because it's not like it, the sign only is what it is in this example, for example, when 
people are relevantly concernfully engaged in their world such as to make sense of the sign so as you said you can't just look at the sign in sort of a pure sense it's not like you just look at the sign and then you sort of you know what it is you have to be relevantly engaged in the context of crossing the street or driving to make sense of the sign as a sign for pointing or you know a danger signal or whatever does that make sense so like like the hammer if i just stare at the hammer blankly as hydra says i'm not going to grasp the sign i'm not going to grasp the hammer as i do when i use it because that context with which looking at a hammer arises in isn't the same as me using a hammer in terms of to do some purpose to fill some function so the same thing is with the sign okay so i guess so we still haven't gotten to why signs are special right they're sort of special so what's special about a sign i think it's tricky i don't quite get it but if, my guess is that based on reading the chapter is that a sign is something it's, a, it's an item of equipment that sort of reorients docile into a certain way of being in the world. So imagine you're driving and you see a stop sign. Like the stop sign then, I don't know, it, it in a sense like reorients your way of operating in that context. So it's a signal to stop, but, but not only is it to stop because it implicitly references other cars that might be of danger. It, it, it also references where to stop. Maybe it references like, you know, uh, other like p police people that you know you don't want to get in trouble uh it might, it might reference you know your kids you don't want to get them and you don't want to hurt them you don't want to pay it, it references your bank account because you don't want to pay for you don't want to pay for money your a new car if you get in a car crash so it the signs sort of reorient you they sort of bring the world into focus they sort of it, it's almost like a turn dial. I, i'm trying to think of metaphors for it. it's like a turn dial it's like it like turns up the it doesn't turn up the heat but it like it's like setting the therm it like resets the thermostat or something i'm trying to think of some weird metaphor for it but uh yeah so i think that's the function that that's what's special about a sign it sort of reworks the way that you find yourself in a situation according to the socially normative uh expectations and um practices and just normal grasp of things as you've grown up in them or been initiated in them so you know a caveman wouldn't understand what a sign is neither would you know a roman if they were somehow you know transported to our time on the street or something they wouldn't they wouldn't even understand what's going on they didn't grow up in that context they don't have a sense for it but we do um and we all do and this is this leads to the point that the world's public which is a which is a good way to i think not misinterpret what Hydra is saying in terms of like an inner sub subjectivity that we have or an idealism that we have then had to ask well this only accounts for my experience not others well everyone's operating in in the same sort of contextual understanding and so it's a shared public world um i'll stop there i think i think i've said a lot <laughs> uh what do you what do you think yeah, about I mean, sign chapter did you think well, it was interesting yeah i mean the section on signs for Heidegger, I think, um, might be um, interesting to consider in light of the the, the, the sign um, investigation in uh, Husserl's logical investigations. Of his work um, Heidegger was reputed to have spent a lot of time reading. It said that um, he he really um, devoted a lot of time in his younger years to that book, in, in particular, was the logical investigations. Um, even before he met Husserl, I think he was, he was um, deeply admiring that work. And of course, he mentions it in this one. It's interesting that the first investigation is on signs. And are you familiar with that investigation? I'm, I, I don't believe I am. Uh, but you, you can go on and unpack it if you want. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, so the, the first logical investigation is about the distinction between two types of signs, indications and expressions. And it seems to me that we kind of lose that distinction with Heidegger. Um, it's not that he's only favoring one of the two, but I mean, certainly you you and your talk about signs, you were mentioning indication a lot more than expression. Would you agree with that? Yeah, uh, he, yeah he definitely says that uh, signs are for indicating. I don't think he uses the term expression. 
Uh, right. He he only really talks, especially the later Heidegger. He only really talks about expression negatively as what he he does not believe language. Right now, it's signs, but uh, that that we're talking about. But of course, the later Heidegger is talking about language is not expression. It's not just you have an idea in your mind and you use words. This is kind of like medium for expressing them in the open. That's exactly not what he thinks about language. Of course, right. that's later Heidegger. That's another discussion. But at this earlier context, I think you lose specifically the Husserlian notion of expression in that, um, first of all, there are things like, um, um, you mentioned the, the car signal, which is kind of, I guess, kind of like the other examples of um, indication that uh, Husserl gives in that um, investigation of things like a gunshot at the beginning of a horse race. So, you know, that's a sign, but it's an indication that the race is supposed to begin. Kind of like a whistle in a basketball game is a sign that, um, you know, a play is supposed to stop, right? So there are these signs which um, sort of almost frames as the lower types of signs, which are mere indications which don't have a meaning. Um, and a meaning for Husserl is something like the part of the world which that person is sort of meaning to talk about. So if you're talking about, um, you know, for example, my house here in India, you know, if I'm intending to talk about it, I sort of intend that object, I'm, really, I'm, I'm directed towards it. And the sign is sort of expression not just of like maybe um, my thoughts about it, but rather as something of the expression is an illumination of that part of the world. It's that object. And there's this sort of intentionality, which is big in uh, Husserl, which I think you're kind of losing in Heidegger's discussion on science in that you lose this emphasis on expression because it's not so much anymore um, for Heidegger, a matter of me intending that object and using science to sort of illuminate it because I'm intending it. Um, it's more that this notion of indications, which lose that sort of subjective flavoring, I think that you get with, um, with expression, can, um, move to the forefront because the kinds of signs that you were talking about, which not so much express my intent as they, um, have reference to other other sort of uh, stuff within within a context. So um, you were mentioning the 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 sort of context in which that traffic sign is caught up, um, which leads me to ask you, based on maybe what I've sort of synopsized about the first investigation, do you think that Heidegger is also sort of moving away from this Husserlian concept of expression, favoring indication? And do you think that's because of the move away from Cartesianism? And obviously Husserl um, really is a Cartesian thinker. He says himself in the ideas, and obviously he had a whole sort of lecture series called the Cartesian Meditations. So it would be, I think, absurd to say that he, he, he's not in some sense a Cartesian thinker. Um, but Husserl has this notion in the ideas that the, what, what Descartes was trying to accomplish and what the early modern thinkers all the way up to David Hume, what they were trying to accomplish was just Husserlian phenomenology. And therefore, I think that um, obviously Heidegger getting away from Descartes, not something Husserl was really doing. He really is sort of just trying to fulfill Cartesianism. Um, but to, to state the question once more, do you think that we're getting away from expression with Heidegger and we're getting something like indication because we're getting away from Cartesianism. Um, sure. Um, so, okay, a few things. One, I think, yes, the sense of expression that you were talking about, like words just express intended thoughts present to the mind, that, if that's what Husserl is saying, Heidegger is in a sense definitely, um, dispatching with that but well, i think it's, it's, it's okay. not it's not so much expressing ideas it's expressing it's illuminating stuff that you're directed towards so for whose role um the example i'll give once again my house in india which most people have no idea about it's all the way in a village in india certainly everybody in america has no idea about this house this house is so obscure it doesn't even have a house number it has a name 
So I live in a village that doesn't even have a Wikipedia article and the houses don't have numbers. They have names, but the name is written in Moyellum script, not in English. So the postman, when he delivers letters, just goes to the house that he knows the person who lives there by their name. That's how obscure the village is. So most people don't intend that house because most people have never seen it, but I can. I can intend that house as an object. That is to say, I can be directed towards that house and the, the expression is really just an expression of my intending or being directed to that house and the, the expression seeks to illuminate that. But I think you're kind of losing this emphasis, which was so important for who's role. You lose, there's not this huge emphasis in Heidegger on intentionality. There's not this huge emphasis on being directed to that object. Obviously, you really are because he's just sort of radicalizing the already out there exterior sort of with stuff. Um, but he, there's not, I, I don't know, if, with your reading of Heidegger, do you think there's not this huge emphasis on intentionality? And, and sorry to interrupt you, um, please by all means continue with what you're saying, but I just want to make that distinction and also sort of bring up, because I think the relation between the, the, the concepts of phenomenology, which Heidegger doesn't use, despite the fact that at the beginning of the book, he insists that phenomenology is ontology, and therefore he's really insisting that this book is phenomenology, and yet you find this sort of abandonment of some of the really big Husserlian terms. Sure. Yeah, it seems like, based on what you said about intentionality, it seems that intentionality, while I don't know if it gets abandoned, I think it just gets reinterpreted into what he calls like comportment. So, or I, I, I think, I think the key to this is going to be thrownness. I think thrownness is, is really where these questions get answered is thrownness and then discourse where discourse expresses the sort of meaning of a thing in the world. Um, but that's a later chapter. Yeah. I don't, I don't really know. I think it's a good question that we should keep in mind. I think rather than intentionality uh, for Heidegger, it becomes comportment towards entities within the world within a situation to which you're already embedded in. I think that's, I think that's what intentionality turns into, maybe. Um, I, do, I don't really know. <laughs> I have to read some more. It's not so much abandoned, maybe those wrong choice of words on my part, but it's sort of radicalized. It's not that... Um, yeah you're losing it, it's rather without losing anything, you're sort of maybe radicalizing and taking the project of phenomenology without, of course, this is something that's not getting away from the project of phenomenology, although the, the story goes that Husserl really considered um, the bigger betrayal um, by Heidegger even bigger than allowing him to be persona non grata at the university. Um, people know that Husserl was actually, you know, with Heidegger's basic approval, made into persona non grata at the university, couldn't even use the library. Um, and yet they say that the real betrayal was, Husserl, uh, was Heidegger abandoning what Husserl thought phenomenology was supposed to be, which was this kind of rigorous science that was a real sort of alternative to the analytic uh, philosophy solution to so many of the kinds of problems, um, which Heidegger's not so much interested in providing a viable alternative to analytic philosophy, as he kind of takes it in this other direction. And rather than doing universal science, who certainly in phenomenology um, really is a type of universal science, whereas I don't think Heidegger considers being in time to be like universal science. It's rather that it is true he's taking phenomenology someplace other than where Husserl really had ambitions for it to go. Would you agree with that? Um, honestly, I don't know, but uh, I know he's doing fundamental ontology. So, you know, Heidegger's going to think that his project proceeds and makes possible, you know, what we normally take to be science or different, you know, anthropology or psychology or politics or whatever. So there is a sense in which I think Heidegger takes what he's doing to be fundamental um, a sort of science of being or any topic whatsoever, maybe. So I don't know. I think, I think that's a good question to keep in mind. I think we might be able to answer that later on. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I don't know. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Maybe, uh, 
we'll we'll finish up with we should just touch on the spatiality section and then we'll we'll be done potentially that good. okay yeah so we so, i think we can sort of jump over uh subsection 18 which is involvement and significance of the worldhood of the world i think we've already sort of touched upon what a world is constituted by it's going to be referential or involvemental relations um, that constitute the meaning of many things within the world um, and that whole of the world to which things are within and we are embedded towards so maybe space space um we, we we've implicitly talked about what space is already so okay so for heidegger what what is space what is what is what he calls the aroundness of the environment and Dasein spatiality? This is going to be uh, section C, sections 22 through 24. We'll try to touch upon it in chapter three. Okay, so, so he begins by saying things like, okay, what is space? Heidegger does not mean space in the sense of like what we normally take space to be, like a 3D container for objects, right? Or the space inside the glass or vase. He doesn't mean the distance between me and the tree over there that's measured in feet, right? This isn't what he means by space. He's not denying, I don't think that space exists. He's not denying the existence of space. He's, talk, he's talking about this, this notion of space that is constitutive of the world itself. Okay, so what is this, you don't wanna really call it aspect, but what is this, what, what is this constituent of the world? Okay, so, so as we've already talked about, and I've been I've been using the term place. So things we don't really want to call them things. They're really you don't want to call them meaningful objects either. You you want to say uh, something ready to hand, an equipment have their place within a world, which is gonna which can either be a certain as we've already talked about, a certain function, um, a certain use, a certain meaning. I think meaning is the broadest sense of this that we're talking about. So he's going to say, quote, equipment has its place. Um, so he's going to say, this must be distinguished in principle from just occurring at random in some spatial position. Um, when equipment for something or other has its place, this place defined itself defines itself as the place of this equipment as one place out of a whole totality of places directionally lined up with each other and belong to the context of equipment that is environmentally ready to hand. Okay, so when we're in a situation, we're always in a situation. At every moment we're in a situation, we are always already in some meaningful situation or world or embedded in some uh, socially, cult culturally context of referential relations with, within which or wherein things have their meaning, as we've talked about, okay? So the space is sort of gonna be those relations between things. So he's gonna give examples to contrast with our normal uh, intuition of space. So he could say something like, he's gonna give examples like, the glasses on your eyes, um, while it's, you know, you're literally touching the glasses, there's a sense in which the glasses are far from you because you're not in touch with them uh, in your uh, situated, dealings in certain contexts. Now, I think this is a bad example, the glasses example, because, I, I don't, tell me if you don't know what I'm talking about. Because I think the glasses have a place in the world. They, 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 and they're, they are close, they, they, they're important, right? It's even, not just are they close to you, but they're, they're very relevant for whatever you wanna do, uh, you know, if you need glasses. So I, I think that's a bad example, though I could be wrong. Um, okay. So then he's going to say, okay, things in the world have what he's calling called directionality. So as we talked about, things are going to point to or reference other things. So the hammer is going to, it's like directed towards the nails, which is going to say like the hail is in order to what? It's going to be in order to punching in these nails. And so that's sort of the directionality of the hammer as I use it. Um, and then, you know, there's, we could talk about many other examples. Um, and so this is going to be, so like radio. So, you know, you have the, you have the saying that like, you know, the world's, so, so, so something like the radio makes the world a smaller place or something. In a sense, that's true. Not, not literally. It's not, you're not saying that the world's shrinking, like it's getting smaller. Like it was, you know, a hundred miles. Now it's 10. He's not saying that it's more like the radio allows us to bring things into our environment that without it could not be. So 
you know, whatever comes on the radio music or something now radio, like music is a possibility for us. It's, it, it can how have its place within the world. We, we, you know, we want to listen to music on the way to work to calm us down, um, to dance at a dance party or, you know, we go for a run at something to motivate us, whatever. Now it has that place. It's, it's what he calls close to us within our environment. And the environment is just going to be another word for, uh, the equipmental totality to which we're embedded in, in some situation. Um, so yeah, things have its place and the, the, the totality of places is the space. It's, it's the sort of space of meaning to which we're embedded. Um, so for example, you know, if you're driving to work, there's a certain sense in which the, the space is already determined. You know, your things have meaning as we've, as I've repeated many, many times, things have a meaning within a context. And that context is sort of the meaning space. It's the spatiality of the space. Right. And so, you know, the things on the, uh, you know, the, 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 the things behind the tree off the side of the road is actually in a sense farther away from you than your work because it's not relevant to you in your dealings in the morning. You know, it, it doesn't matter to you, even though it's 10 feet away as you drive, it's still, it's far away. It's, it's not within the scope of your meaningful context. It's not relevant. It doesn't have a meaning. It's not, you're, it's not even that you're just not aware of it. It's that it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's, it doesn't, it doesn't appear as something meaningful at all. Um, even like your back seat, your back seat, you know, unless you're driving your kids to work or something, or you're, you're driving your kids to your school and then the back seat is really relevant because you got to make sure it's secure for your kid to strap in. Maybe it's a baby or something, or you got to put things back there. But if you're just driving to work by yourself, the back seat doesn't, it probably won't arise having a place within your context because it hasn't, the need for it doesn't arise because it doesn't have a place. It, um, it does. It's not like it disappears when you don't need it or anything. It's just, it doesn't get grasped as something urgent or meaningful or mattering. Um, it just becomes something irrelevant. And so you don't have to pay attention to it. Um, and so this is sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get at what he's calling space uh, through these ex examples. Um, yeah. And so, and so, so different, what, he, what he's going to call different, you know, spatial boundaries. He's going to call that, he's eventually going to call that like, um, he's going to call it a region, right? So uh, my trip to work, that context is its own region. It, it has its own meaning space uh, that involve, that is, is constituted by these referential relations that where things in that, things with a, things within that totality are what he calls directionally lined up to other things they're going to reference or point to or have a purpose or have some meaning. Um, you know, th even think about, th 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 think about, uh, I don't know, like the president's giving a speech in front of millions of people, you know, in front of the white house and there's the white, there's the American flag, right. And the, the flag has a meaning. It's not just like a piece of cloth, right? That is what it is. Yes. But it also has like a meaning. It's a symbol of national unity or whatever. And so that's going to point to, that's going to point to like different things implicitly. It's going to, it's going to be a, as it, it's also a sign or if we go back to signs, it's going to, it's going to be a sign that sort of brings us into focus in some sense. Uh, and so if the, if the flag were to, you know, fall, it's going to be a tragedy or if it, someone were to rip it up, it's going to be, you know, it's going to, it's going to be an issue. It's going to, it's, it's going to have a different meaning. I don't know. Uh, more, more, there's many examples. So yeah, so basically in the first chapter of the space section, he's saying that things have their place, their place within a spatial context. And by space, we don't mean like the distance from here to the tree measured in feet. We don't mean the space in the vase. We don't mean a 3D container um, with things in it. We don't mean that. We mean sort of the meaning space to which things are in and we are embedded towards. I guess, and things are close if they're important or relevant in some way, and they're far away if they don't quite matter. Um, yeah, so so my work, even though it's fifty miles away, is relevant to me, and so it's it's close within my environment. But the thing on the side of the road is not relevant to me because I'm not engaging with it in some way. And so even though it's closer in a sort of pure uh, 
distant sense of feet, it's still it's still farther than my work, even though if work is 50 miles away. Because it matters to me. It's relevant. It's within my world. It's it has its place within a context of my life and other people, that kind of thing. Anyway, I've talked a lot. <laughs> what do you what do you think? Um yeah, that's a very good sort of uh, synopsis of the the thought of this chapter. Um, I think that um, it's a bit late at night for me, so I don't know that I have many things just coming right to mind. But um, I think that uh, you know this has been a very nice sort of um, look into what is a very difficult book, um, but you provide a very accessible way, I think, for for everybody listening to to grasp some of these very, very complicated ideas. And, um, you know, uh, I think that that's great. I'll go ahead and check the um, the, the, the chat if um, you're curious if there was anybody um, who has been uh, commenting. I don't think the last time I checked that there was any, there were any comments, but um, we've been on a, there for a while, so I'll go ahead and check again. Somebody says um, this person is Zeno today. So space is indicative of meaningfully objects for Heidegger. Um, so space as indicative of meaningful objects for Heidegger. That's a, an interesting question. Uh, what would your response to that question be? Wait, so what's the question? Sorry, I didn't get it. What's the, the question is space, space is indicative of meaningful objects for Heidegger. I think that's the, the quote. It's, well, it's literally space as indicative of meaningfully objects for Heidegger. Let me pull this back up. I, I don't know that uh, I'm quite understanding the, the, the question, but that's just because it is a bit late at night here in India. But um, if you, and, and thank you, by the way, uh, to the person who left that comment. Um, so space is indicative of meaningfully objects for Heidegger's question. Okay, sure. Um, I would say, Yes, though I don't quite understand the specifics of the question. So yeah, so uh, space is that meaningful context. It's it, it, it's our implicit it's our implicit grasp of the context or situation we are embedded in at any moment or at any particular moment that within which within this context this understanding or grasp of our situation things have a meaning in light of that. So think if you're a student in a you know, you're you're a middle you're a high school or middle school student in a classroom, right? The sort of the the space isn't so much the room. It it it's it's more like the classroom. See, there's a difference there. It's not just the empty space in the room. It's not like the space is you can it, getting at the spatiality of the classroom isn't just like you measure the distance of the room, right? in terms of 3D dimensions. That, that's not what Heidegger means. He means more, it's like, it's like the classroom. It's like the possibilities within, the possibilities that arise within a classroom setting. So you're there to do work. Things have a certain meaning within your context of trying to get work done. Or maybe, you know, you're not trying to get work done, but you're trying to make friends or, you know, the teacher has its place because it's an authority figure that you have to pay attention to to get a good grade. And also, it also references your need to go to college because you have to get grades to go to college. It's also going to reference, you know, if, I don't know if you have a crushing class and you're, you're throwing a, a paper airplane to someone or whatever that th things are good. Things have meaning within a classroom setting sort of. And so the, we might say that the classroom setting is sort of the space within which things arise. So you're going to have things like textbooks, notebooks, um, students and teachers. It's, it's it's not just that those are the things that you find in a classroom. It's more like that implicit grasp of your situation is what underpins all those objects in the room. In a sense, uh, yeah. So it's it's the meaning space. It's 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 the it's the grasp of your situation, and then 
what what meaning things have within that context. And so if you if like for example if you were uh, I don't know if 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 you were if it was like um, you know bring your dad to bring your dad to school day you know your your dad the, the dad understands the classroom but not in the same way that you as the twelve year old kid does. So while there is an overlap of world there, there's an overlap of meaning. It's there, there's sort of a different meaning. So so for example, even like your book, like your book is your book, right? It's the one you've been given. So you have certain rights to it that other people don't. And so that's going to be part of a small part of that situation. And so you're using it to get a good grade. And whereas your dad's not going to be interested in that book or, or maybe only for the purpose of making sure you're getting a good, good, good grade. So I don't know. There, I, I can try to give more examples, but uh, maybe stop there, if that makes sense. I think that was a very um, good response to that question, um, and okay. uh, thank you for for taking that question, and, and thank you to the person who who posted it. Um, I guess you know since we've, we've been talking for a while and it is getting a bit late, I just want to ask if there was any maybe last thoughts you had or maybe ambitions for where you want to go from here. I know you mentioned that. Um, the window of, of time to to do a lot with this book was maybe um, getting a bit narrow. Uh, so, um, what, where do you want to go from from here with this with this group reading? Sure, great. No, uh, okay, yeah, a few things. One, uh, I thought today was good. I think we can move on just to the next chapter, um, which is I think being being with uh, the Who of Everyday Dasein. So we can we can try to tackle the next. Um, constitutive item of being in the world. Remember at the beginning of this discussion, we talked about that there's three items of being in the world that are unified together. So we had world, we had being in, and we had the who of everyday Dasein. So the next section I think covers the next chapter, the who of everyday, of the who of everyday Dasein. So maybe we could focus in on that. Um, that's a possibility. We could recap what we've done so far. Um, if anyone has any questions, I encourage anyone to post questions so that uh, we can you know, elucidate things for people who have questions and that sort of thing, uh, or just thoughts or comments or questions, uh, suggestions of things to say more clearer, um, you know, should the videos be shorter or whatever. Appreciate that. Um, but yeah, uh, maybe we could just, after this video, we'll just talk off video to see what we're to, for the details, what we're going to do next. Real yeah, quick. I think that's, I think that's great. Um, what I've been personally doing myself Lately, is I've been reading Being Time, but I've also been reading Israel's Ideas, I guess, which is kind of why uh, some of the connections, um, you know, I think are, are they're there. And it's helpful maybe to be in both systems of thought, maybe simultaneously. So if that was a component that interested you too, maybe bringing in sort of like the sort of simultaneous, because there's been a lot of um, books written about both thinkers, but my own experience when I was in grad school and I was I was looking at these different academic monographs about both, I never really found any of them to be particularly satisfying because most of them would subordinate one thinker to the other. There's this temptation to read Husserl as well. This is just what we thought before this insight we got with, with being in time that sort of completed it. And I think Dreyfus actually said something um, kind of ridiculous uh, to the effect of, well, you know, Husserl never really understood that book anyway, which is not true. You know, he had other reasons for not agreeing with it, but not understanding it, just that's not true, what, what, what Dreyfus said. Um, but I think that also, um, a lot of the um, people who do really good, serious work on his role are more like analytic philosophy people who might simply miss the insights of being in time because that's just not the kind of book that they're used to reading. So I think that I've never really found a study of both thinkers that was satisfactory to me. Um, so I think that might be another interesting sort of avenue to look at is kind of a serious look at both books, actually reading both texts at the same time like I've been doing the past couple weeks. So I don't know if that's something that interests you too. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we'll have to see. Uh, we'll have to you know pick out maybe certain passages or parts of the text that we think are beneficial. But yeah, shoot, shoot, uh, email me some uh, suggestions and I'll take a look if you have any. Yeah, sounds great. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, that's a great plan to, to, to go forward with. And um, yeah, once again, thank you for joining me. It was a great discussion. And uh, sure the viewers um, 
also enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I look forward to, to our next meeting. All right, man. See you later. Thanks. Take it easy.